In August 1945, a motion picture camera crew enters the city of Hiroshima, Japan to record startling images of the first city devastated by an atomic bomb. There were those who said that Hiroshima would remain uninhabitable, forever poisoned by radiation. And that those who were exposed to the bomb would all be dead within three years. What has become of the Hiroshima survivors? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. On July 16, 1945, a signal flare illuminates the barren New Mexico desert as scientists anxiously await the detonation of the world's first atomic weapon. President Truman, the inevitable dilemma. Should the weapon be used against Japan? Believing that it will bring a speedy end to World War II and the savings of millions of lives, the president issues the order, drop the bomb. In the early morning of August 6th, a B-29 named the Enola Gay departs the Pacific island of Tinian en route to Japan. For a payload, a single five-ton bomb nicknamed Little Boy. The mood in Hiroshima that morning was one of uneasy anticipation. While other Japanese cities were being leveled by American bombers, Hiroshima remained unchanged and no one in Japan could understand why. Some thought Hiroshima was being spared because it was too beautiful to bomb. They thought the Americans were saving it to build villas there. Others speculated that a relative of President Truman's, perhaps even his mother, was living in the city, and that's why the city was being spared. Yet there were those who foresaw the real reason. Hiroshima was being reserved for a special, highly destructive weapon. Many survivors remember seeing the B-29 over Hiroshima that morning, but paid it little heed. And few could see a small, shiny object falling from the plane. Kaz Suishi was an American of Japanese descent living in Hiroshima at the time of the bomb. She was two miles from the bomb's hypocenter. It was a beautiful blue sky that morning. I heard the sound of the plane and I looked up and saw the B-29. I was not concerned because the B-29 used to come every single day, but it never dropped bombs. I thought it was beautiful. It looked like a silver angel. Then after the B-29 was gone, there was still a little dot, a tiny little dot falling to the ground. At first, I thought it was a parachute, and I thought, how brave the American must be to parachute into the city. During the 43 seconds it took for the bomb to fall to Earth, most of the inhabitants of Hiroshima weren't even aware they were in any danger, and none could imagine the devastation that was to follow. In an instant, the city of Hiroshima, Japan, was obliterated. 
metal fused with stone, sand turned to glass. It was as if the sun had come in contact with the earth. Every structure within a two mile radius of the bomb's hypocenter was destroyed. Another Hiroshima survivor is Florence Yamada Garnett. She was 13 years old at the time and lost most of her family in the explosion. It is only recently that she has been able to talk about her experiences. The next thing you knew, uh, the building was falling on top of you. Um, there was a pressure, like somebody was just stepping all over you. Um, it was, and then the heat, after the explosion of the bomb, you can feel the heat. Uh, you suck in the air, and you think you're dying. You, I was rolled across the school, schoolyard. Uh, that's about all I remember at the time. The temperature near the center of the blast was so great, human beings literally evaporated, leaving behind, in some cases, nothing but their shadows etched into stone and concrete. No one is certain how many were killed in the blast. Conservative estimates put the figure at 70,000, with many thousands more to die in the weeks and months to follow. Within days, medical personnel attempt to treat the tens of thousands of seriously injured. Severe burns and mutilations are so numerous medical facilities so primitive that most of the severely injured have little chance at all for survival. As one doctor puts it, Hiroshima is a sea of dead and dying. You could see people running out of the city, skin hanging, some burned to look like charred, but they were still moving. I remember seeing um, people just sitting, sitting, or standing, charred to death. I recall a man that was on a bicycle that was still leaning against the bridge, and another person taking the body off of the bike and then taking, uh, riding the bike away. I thought it was cruel at that time, but of course, it's survival for yourself. As horrible as their experiences have been, many of the survivors are soon to learn more terror is to confront them. Within days and weeks, the survivors begin to notice in themselves a strange, insidious form of illness. The survivors attribute the symptoms to A-bomb disease. They are actually the effects of acute atomic radiation never experienced before. One man who understands the terror of radiation poisoning is Dr. Robert J. Lifton, a psychiatrist who has spent several years in Hiroshima and has interviewed numerous atomic bomb survivors. Well, with most wars and with the use of conventional weapons, you kill people. Then both sides bury their dead. They then return to life as usual. Oh, they grieve and there's pain, but life goes on in the old-fashioned way. In Hiroshima, the bomb was dropped, and that was the beginning of lifelong effects. For instance, days, weeks, months after the bomb was dropped, and sometimes in people who seemed unaffected by the bomb, to have no marks on their bodies, they would suddenly find themselves having weird symptoms, very grotesque symptoms, bleeding from all of their bodily openings, bleeding into the skin, severe diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, extreme weakness, high fever, and when white blood counts could be taken, very high white blood counts, extreme weakness, and in many cases, death. If people lived a little longer, other grotesque symptoms would follow, such as their hair falling out. Now, these were the symptoms of acute radiation effects. 
Nobody understood this at the time. They simply sensed that there was some kind of poison in the bomb. And the people in Hiroshima began to feel that this is a weapon that leaves behind poison in your bones. And that poison may strike you down at any time. The first thing we get up, we, we would do is get up in the morning and look at your forearm. And if you didn't have any purple spots, that means you're going to live for a couple of days. Uh, with me, I went, like as I said, I went through the radiation sickness of uh, vomiting, nausea, de dehydration, um, complete loss of hair. But um, I was one of, one of the lucky ones to survive. Uh, this was the first thing you would do in the morning is look at your arm, comb your hair, and if it starts falling out, you feel... Your time is coming for very soon. There was no panic about it. It was just an everyday reality at the time. Um, however, uh, the people who are not exposed to the bomb directly were very hesitant in going back into the city. By that time, they had we had heard there was a different type of a bomb that if you were exposed to the bomb, you may not live. Within weeks, the survivors of Hiroshima begin the lengthy and burdensome task of rebuilding. Unknown to them, the effects of the bomb would haunt them for years to come in ways they could not imagine. When an atomic bomb explodes, it produces heat, light, and blast effects. In addition, there is the emission of invisible rays of atomic matter that bombard everything within the blast area. These invisible rays, referred to as radiation, have the capability of penetrating the human body. In small doses, certain types of radiation, like that used frequently in medical diagnosis, is believed to be harmless. But in massive amounts, like that experienced at Hiroshima, the results can be deadly. Penetrating the human body, radiation strikes deep within the cells our bodies are made of. When a damaged cell reproduces itself, instead of dividing to produce a new healthy cell, it manufactures an identically damaged cell. This type of growth, which frequently takes years to surface, leads to the disease we call cancer. Scientists had been aware of the harmful effects of radiation for some time and wanted to determine how much of it had been received in Hiroshima. Human bone fragments, one of the materials that best retains radiation, were collected at various locations in the city for analysis later. The early findings revealed that a large amount of highly toxic beta and gamma radiation had been dispersed throughout the city at the time of the explosion. What effect this would have on the Hiroshima survivors was still unknown. All that was certain was that many of the survivors, even those who seemed unscathed by the bomb, were carrying within their bodies the potential for great harm that would not reveal itself for years to come. Dr. Stuart Finch has recently concluded a 34-year investigation into the delayed effects of radiation exposure. Major findings uh, early were the occurrence of uh, increased cataracts in the lenses of the eyes and then the increased occurrence of leukemia, which in the heavily exposed population reached a peak rate of about 40 times the normal rate. Concomitantly, there's been an increased rise in cancer rates in Hiroshima, uh, particularly cancer of the stomach, cancer of the thyroid, uh, cancer of the lung, breast cancer, and most recently, uh, the occurrence of multiple myeloma, which is a form of bone cancer. I think it is uh, safe to say that there has been a definite relationship established between the occurrence of uh, exposure in these survivors and the occurrence of cancer. The effects of radiation can remain hidden for generations. When sex cells are radiated, the victims may remain in perfect health, but pass on genetic damage to their offspring. When hundreds of exposed women who were pregnant at the time of the explosion gave birth to defective children, it created widespread fears of permanent genetic damage. But the damage suffered by children in the womb was the result of direct exposure to radiation, 
not genetic inheritance. Nonetheless, fears of genetic damage continued for years until Hiroshima had been rebuilt and thousands of healthy children were born to Hiroshima survivors. Today, most authorities conclude that the genetic threat from radiation in Hiroshima is much smaller than previously believed. One man who thinks differently is Dr. Gerald Hirsch of the Wadsworth Medical Center in Los Angeles. The most recent studies indicate little and or few long-term genetic effects for radiation. One recent study indicated that only one child out of 12,000 children of radiation-exposed Japanese had a mutation. However, several years ago, we developed a test that we thought would pick up a majority of mutations. The test uses just an ounce of blood and involves the purification of the oxygen-carrying protein of red cells. Many of the radiation-exposed people had an abnormal value in this test. These data indicate that the mutation rate for radiation may be much higher than we previously thought, perhaps as much as a thousand times higher. If Dr. Hirsch's findings are correct, it would mean that seemingly healthy children could be carrying genetic damage that might not reveal itself for generations. We're not sure, though, how many of the mutations measured by this test will have bad effects in future generations. A single bomb devastated a city and left its survivors with lifelong suffering. How deep are the scars of Hiroshima? Nuclear weapons are radically different from ordinary bombs. If you compare, for instance, the destruction of Tokyo to that of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, well, Tokyo was completely destroyed. More people were killed in Tokyo than were killed in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. But it took thousands of bombs, over hours of saturation bombing, to do that to Tokyo. In Hiroshima, a single bomb dropped from a single plane destroyed an entire city. Now that created in survivors in Hiroshima the sense of a sudden and absolute shift from normal existence to an overwhelming encounter with death. They suddenly fa found themselves in the midst of a sea of dead and dying, and they walked about in a daze, like people in a dream, as they described it, not really knowing whether they were dead or alive. Now, one imagines that in the midst of disaster, people are panic-stricken, running around, screaming. That's not the way it was in Hiroshima. Rather, they walked around quietly, as in a silent movie, very muted, very still. And when you see the films of those early days, that's the kind of faces that you see. That's also psychic numbing. Their minds are shut down, they're muted. It's a defense against ordinary or normal degrees of feeling because one simply couldn't permit oneself ordinary forms of feeling and suffering, ordinary psychological pain, to those influences and still remain sane. The psychological pain suffered in Hiroshima still exists today. I guess it was about 10 years ago when I had a fire in the house. Uh, there was a time when at that time, I couldn't separate Hiroshima and present. And that was, as weird as it sounds, it was very true. I came, became very hysterical, which I wasn't hysterical during, during the Hiroshima fire. Um, I could not separate Hiroshima and present. Um, I had to stay off of work for about a month. Um, and the doctors did not know what to do with me. Um, I didn't realize that it was a common, uh, would you call it neurosis or whatever it was that, that, that happened. We're finding about more of, the, more of those things now. Hundreds of Hiroshima survivors now live in the United States, in areas like Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. Most do not want to be identified. They feel a sense of shame and embarrassment in being a survivor. It has been through the efforts of people like Paul Tsunishi of the Japanese American League that the plight of the Hiroshima survivor is now emerging into the open. 
Various Japanese groups have organized radiation seminars held in major American cities. We are bringing a program, a public forum to you today. At this one held recently in Los Angeles, the public learns that the effects of Hiroshima are still being felt more than 35 years after the bomb. I am a victim and a survivor of the atomic bomb. The specific problems are medical insurance, their inability to get insurance, or if they have insurance, they don't want the carriers to know it. And they're not sure what will happen if it becomes known that they are survivors of radiation from before. Additionally, there's a question of getting, getting and maintaining jobs because they might be ostracized because of that. And there's a social uh, stigma of being ostracized from the larger group. For Kaz Sawishi, the seminar reawakens tragic memories. The photographed images of a devastated Hiroshima will never be forgotten by those who see them. seconds, a city was destroyed, yet its legacy may last forever, perhaps making all of us Hiroshima survivors. If a bomb were dropped today, there would be no outside world, nobody there to help. There would be no recovery.